he probably doesn't need much introduction, but it really gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Michael Baker. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, uh, hearing what you've got to say about disinformation, misinformation, uh, science, the role of science, uh, trust, democracy, and your new public health communication centre. Um, by way of introduction, um, it's probably like we all feel we know Michael, uh, uh, because it, I read that he did over 2,000 COVID-19 interviews and actually received the Prime Minister's um, communication prize for his sterling efforts. So we've probably all seen a lot of Michael. Um, um, and you, you probably know that he's you know a, now a member of the New Zealand Order of Merit for the um, amazing work he did uh, during the COVID-19 response. But you might not be aware of some of the other uh, achievements um, of Michael, Michael's other achievements. And they, they all have sort of medical communications and political dimensions from my perspective. So back in the 80s, um, he was in the Minister of Health's office and worked on um, the um, HIV, HIV AIDS epidemic and is credited with being one of the major architects of the New Zealand's needle swap scheme. Um, which he got through, uh, you know, this is a population that suffers a lot of stigma and it got, he got this, these, this program through and it's, and it's saved a lot of lives. So that's, that's another one of Michael's achievements. And another one that I, I think I, I first became aware of Michael was, um, uh, I believe he was on the front page of truth, I believe, um, uh, in his campaign to clean up the New Zealand poultry industry, because New Zealand had a Campylobacter uh, epidemic. I'm not certain if we still do, but um, uh, but anyway, that was a, a great campaign. So before I hand over to Michael, um, I'd just like to um, outline how we're going to run this session. So Michael's going to talk for about 20, 25 minutes. Um, you're welcome to post stuff to the chat, you know, whether it's comments or questions to the chat. But um, once he's finished his address, we're actually going to put you into uh, small groups so you can have a little bit of a discussion uh, about um, what Michael's been talking about and come up with two or three questions that um, when we come back to plenary, uh, you will have appointed a spokesperson. That spokesperson can ask Michael um, the question, that your, your main question. And if someone else has asked that question, that's why you've got another one or two questions up your sleeve. So um, that's how we're going to run it. Um, so uh, with, without further ado, I'd like to um, hand over to Michael. Yeah, well, kia ora koutou, everyone. Um, I'm actually uh, calling you uh, from Oslo, where I'm based for um, three months. And I was really delighted when Simon approached me uh, to join your meeting because I think it's a real privilege and I feel I'm really talking with very like-minded people. So I'll just um, share my, um, the host has shared the screen for me, but um, I know whenever I've talked with Simon, uh, I've been very impressed by the, the, the discourse that you're promoting about better ways of running democracies. And as I'm going to, I think, illustrate there's uh, huge synergies between what I think you're trying to achieve and what you could say is a, a public health uh, agenda. So being an academic, of course, I have lots of slides, uh, but hopefully we'll have plenty of time for discussion as well. So hopefully you can see that okay and you can hear me okay, but let me know if there's any issues. So Looking on your website, I can see that um, Trust Democracy is looking at ways of making democracy work as it should. And here's one, one definition of public health. It's the science and art of promoting health, preventing disease, and prolonging life. But the critical part of this, it's through the organized efforts of society. Obviously, it supports uh, treating those who are ill, but it's much more concerned with what we call population health and working upstream, and as we'll discuss, looking at the determinants of health. So today I'm going to talk a bit about the new Public Health Communication Centre. 
the idea of evidence-informed policy, which I'm sure is very familiar to all of you, uh, improving government decision-making processes. And uh, you probably know more about this area than I do. We certainly, I'll certainly touch on some quite vivid examples from public health. The idea of informing the public, uh, that is one thing we try to do, but um, also providing some protection from disinformation. So, Michael, um, could you just share your slides? Oh, sorry, are they not, are they not sharing uh, there? Yep. Okay. Um, I suddenly saw a big picture of myself and I thought that they were sharing. Sorry about yep. that. Um, there we go. That's it. Yep. Okay. Um, let me just go to the quick view there. That's it. Uh, so, yeah, great to join you and uh, your AGM. And uh, one of the things uh, I was looking at the, the commonality, the Venn diagram of your interests and those of public health. And I, I think the overlap is very large. And I did note your focus on making democracy work as it should. And this is, uh, I think, a very uh, nice definition of public health. It's about the science and art of promoting health of any disease, prolonged life, but it's it's got this huge focus on the organized efforts of society. Uh, so it goes beyond just uh, the treatment of people who are ill. And so today I was gonna talk about uh, uh, the role of the Public Health Communication Center, uh, supporting uh, evidence-informed policy, uh, better decision-making processes, and this area of informing the public and protecting protection against this information we feel we've got a, a limited role in this area, but we are contributing. So the new Public Health Communication Center, uh, its purpose and rationale, what it is and what it does. Uh, so it's funded by an endowment from the Philanthropic Gamma Foundation. So it's a small team and it was launched in February this year. So our, our purpose is promoting policy practice and public awareness that protects and improves the health, well-being and equity of the people of Aotearoa, but also the health of the environment in which we live. So it sounds easy, but then the, the, the challenging part is, is actually how you achieve that. So one thing we're aware of is that we have a wealth of uh, public health expertise and research. I think the pandemic illustrated why you need independent advice and uh, commentary. And uh, also, the fact that actually we're not talking about incrementalism, we're talking really about the need for transformational changes. And one of the other um, uh, longer term trends is what appears to be um, a reduced pool of independent voices. And we've seen that, for example, with um, uh, Tafata Ora, um, the fact that there's now one government agency that has um, covers all of the um, public health units which in a way used to have a greater level of independence. And we can also see how uh, there are some constraints on independent spokespeople in those uh, organizations. Uh, also, um, obviously there's pressure on the media uh, and uh, the fact that uh, increasingly we're aware of how public health research is competing against well-resourced commercial interest groups. Uh, one of the things, uh, of course, during the pandemic is um, uh, we, we saw how important it was to have an evidence form strategy. And I think it was a very vivid example of effective science and good political leadership. Uh, and we really saw that very vividly during that period. And I think that's contributed to or really motivated us to try and take some of the best things we've learned from that and extend it. So we actually uh, have a small group. We have um, two full-time staff and a part-time center manager, and then uh, very part-time directors and affiliated researchers who are forming the core group. We also have uh, some uh, excellent, um, an excellent board who uh, meet periodically to give us strategic advice. So the things we do, we host uh, a publication, an online publication, the Public Health Expert Briefing. That's actually evolved from what used to be a blog that we ran for 10 years, but obviously we've got a lot more resources now to um, 
increase the quality and reach of this. And we're obviously trying to highlight important research and evidence through a range of other channels as well. Um, obviously, media releases, op-eds, and social media, and also direct contact with researchers, journalists, and policy professionals. So when we try and think about schematically, what are we trying to achieve? Well, uh, we could split it. This is slightly, it's, it's all a two-way relationship. It's really a network, but we can think about policy uh, or content producers, so researchers, partner organizations, the wider research community, and really this massive international uh, uh, literature and information. So this is source material, and then we've got a range of channels. I mentioned the briefing, social media, um, more standard media, and, and, and uh, also uh, organized um, submissions. And when we started off, I think a lot of the time people think oh, our goal is to communicate with the New Zealand public. But actually, our primary focus is on policymakers. Uh, we accept that health practitioners are also a, a distinct audience. But the public, of course, as, as we know, is so seg segmented, it's very hard to say for anyone to say we are actually communicating, I think, with the public. So when we are looking at the area of um, evidence-informed policymaking, a lot of this is around agenda setting, identifying emerging issues, often reframing them, and then this area of evidence translation, particularly around uh, new interventions, which can be quite transformative. But often it's about tracking and updating issues we know very well and saying uh, the evidence is continuing to evolve. I mean, an issue like um, New Zealand's move towards uh, eliminating tobacco use as a public health problem has been 60 years in the making. So we're always putting out refinements. It's not in a way an emerging issue, but it has many new strands such as vaping, for instance. So the briefing is um, doesn't have a regular cycle. We put it out as um, issues appear and it's highlighting new research, putting it in an international context, often commenting on breaking news and analysis of policy developments. Uh, so this is the kind of thing we can do, uh, for example, looking at um, recent um, flooding events and climate disruption, we can try and put these in a longer term context of sudden mass fatality events created by uh, public health disasters and where uh, this event fits in that, that um, sequence. And the fact that very rarely are these events occurring in isolation. So it's something we can do to, again, give them a wider context. Uh, we can look at, uh, this is a very specific, specific example, for instance, an emerging, uh, this is a genuinely emerging problem with um, uh, the rise of an invasive um, streptococcal disease. I mean, it's a, a, a bacteria that deserves a lot of respect. It causes rheumatic fever, uh, toxic shock syndrome, uh, scarlet fever and a whole range of things, but it's also emerging more as invasive infection. So we had, say, a specific angle on uh, making this a notifiable condition, for instance. And while we put this out in our briefing, we then engage with the media, and that actually gives these stories much more uh, impact. And journalists are looking for high-quality, well-formed content. Uh, this is, um, again, another issue where it really was around reframing. And this was when we launched the new centre, we put out a series of uh, explainer issues, picking up bigger issues, like how we respond to things like inequality. This is an example of an issue we've been tracking for a few years, nitrate contamination of drinking water. And so we put out uh, an item on this uh, really more than two years ago in our old format. And uh, then that led to a lot of media interest. And um, we see the way these issues um, uh, um, roll through the, the, um, the media and then eventually getting a lot of um, uh, pickup um, and drawing in other um, interested groups like the College of Midwives and ultimately leading to wider review and eventually a funded research on this topic. Um, so this, this shows the the way in which something you, you pick up on early can actually 
uh, and it needs to have longer longer term focus if it's an important issue. Uh, we also do some systematic um, content analysis of some issues to see how they're being managed in the media. This is obviously quite labor intensive, so we'd only do it for something that we're really going to track uh, for a sustained period. So beyond the briefing, we do a lot of other things um, that we're, we're building up as we get um, more resources and better established. Um, and I think that nitrate issue would be the example of the kind of way we would run with some issues for maybe a number of years. So one area where I think there's a lot of overlap with what we're doing, and I think uh, the ideals that you're promoting is really government decision-making processes. And this is thinking about what are some of the high level uh, frameworks for, for thinking about the efforts in New Zealand? And obviously there's uh, a, a tradition that well, goes back, I guess, millennia about how societies make decisions and the concept of better democracy. We also think about particularly the commercial determinants of health are a huge driver we're very conscious of and some specific goals like the shift to long-term thinking. So, uh, one of the frameworks that you, you may have picked up on is the idea of the Sustainable Development Goals and, in fact, um, by the UN. And it is obviously a, a very aspirational global agenda. And I know many uh, of these pick up on what we call public health concerns, but also some of them on uh, decision-making or dem dem democratic concerns. And the Sustainable Development Goal 16, for instance, around building effective accountability and inclusive institutions. Obviously, some of this is quite anodyne because it has to be um, taken up by, by all countries on earth, and they may not necessarily warm to uh, the, a, a very um, explicit statement about the benefits of democratic decision-making, for instance, but uh, I think buried in here are some still some very good principles. But um, in a more specific area, this is where um, we are focusing a lot more interest, and that is addressing the commercial determinants of health. And there's a huge um, series in The Lancet of about 30 papers. It's just started. I think it's, I haven't read all of them. I just started flicking through them. But it's pointing out that, uh, uh, these commercial determinants of health are the systems, practices, and pathways through which commercial actors drive health and equity. And really, um, this series, and I think many others who've looked at this area, have catalogued a, a huge range of concerns. And this shift towards market fundamentalism and these powerful transnational corporations has created a pathological system in which commercial actors are increasingly enabled to cause harm and externalize the costs of doing so. And they've got some nice models which show the real complexity of uh, this area. But some of the fundamentals are actually very simple, I think. Uh, so in New Zealand, uh, there's quite a focus at the moment, and this is um, Health Coalition Aotearoa, I think, are really leading this, uh, looking at the role of, of lobbyists and uh, the need for greater restrictions on uh, how lobbyists can operate. And uh, some of the data collected on the access that lobbyists have, you know, the, the, the most blatant example being the, the swipe card <laughs> access issue that's come up. But of course, it goes much deeper than that. And I think uh, we're also very grateful for organizations like Transparency International, which I guess regularly flag New Zealand as right at the top in, in terms of transparency, but there are many facets to, to this area. One quite specific aspect of, um, of uh, government processes is uh, one that we've really highlighted. This was the first um, of our explainer issues when we launched the new center, the need for long-term thinking. And uh, you can really look at just how much we're trapped in a very short-term perspective when um, many people would argue, and there's actually even a whole philosophy, long-termism, that you need to be looking at not just the health of those alive now, but those that are yet to be born, and just thinking to what extent do we value the future as opposed to just value, valuing what's right in front of us. And government is concerned about this, and there are some reforms, but I think we need to go a lot further. Uh, it is always interesting uh, 
how um, uh, the, a lot of this is, it takes on a, obviously a political ear. And this is, um, so a dictatorship of the unelected academics is still running what remains of the government's COVID policy. Mark my words, life would be very different if we had our hands on the helm. And of course, uh, Emerson always seems like quite a sympathetic um, cartoonist, um, obviously position, positioning this thinking uh, in the, the graveyard, which um, we, all, we all, all enjoyed, of course, in public health. So uh, there's obviously a whole lot of other um, key issues here um, uh, and how we um, improve information to the public and provide some protection from disinformation. So there's issues around trust in science, impact of disinformation, health-seeking behavior, and the whole social license for government action. So looking at some of these things, uh, certainly in the first year of the pandemic, uh, surveys showed there was very high levels of trust in scientists and government. Um, and this might, survey may have been, I think it was done in 2020 and reported after that. And we know that um, uh, pandemic is a very unusual special case where you need um, high quality information to inform people. Uh, and because the behavior of individuals affects population risk, that's a special feature of infectious diseases. And ultimately it builds trust and collective action and social license. So I think that was a golden period for um, very high public support for um, what uh, a collective response. Um, and one of the things we always think, and this is about framing, uh, if you have a successful response, uh, we say a public health triumph, nothing happened. And this is partly the problem that if you get it right, if you control the pandemic at source and minimize its harm, you do get um, uh, the fact that there's very little um, visible impact. And actually, the science really does show that in New Zealand's case. And so this is quite a complex graph, but it's basically, it's, it's reporting what we think is still the best indicator of the success or otherwise of a pandemic response. And this is cumulative excess mortality during the course of the pandemic. And countries like um, the US and the UK lost about 0.3% of their populations from COVID-19 because their responses were quite poor. Countries in our region did better, say Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, we all took elimination approaches and pushed down mortality, particularly early in the pandemic. But New Zealand is still the only significant country in terms of population size to have achieved net zero excess mortality during the course of the pandemic. And that's actually right up to um, quite recently, that's the situation. And that's because the pandemic measures also stopped other infectious diseases. So. Uh, in a sense, yes, nothing happened according to one metric anyway in New Zealand. Uh, so hopefully the public appreciates that um, the work of government, the work of themselves, and I think the huge work of our public sector has achieved very good outcomes. Of course, uh, it doesn't stop the stream of misinformation and disinformation. I remember during the occupation, this guy was waving his sign around there which was, of course, completely wrong, but it was always in the camera about natural immunity, 99.6% effective. He obviously wasn't keeping up with the New England Journal of Medicine, which said it, at that time it was about 56% effective. Uh, so uh, I think the high point of disinformation for me was um, the scene where a group at the occupation were wearing their foil helmets to deal with the e EMR radiation beaming out of Parliament. And they said, actually, we have to leave because they'd stripped a the local supermarket of its supply of foil. And at that time, there was also these, uh, this interview on Counterspin with Liz Gunn, who couldn't get through the interview because she actually had COVID-19 at the time. So it was a strange uh, parallel universe and I think not that much overlap in the Venn diagrams in terms of our source science that we're dealing with. And I think the public is obviously quite alarmed. This is a survey done in New Zealand uh, about um, the public perception of having encountered misinformation. Somewhat are very concerned and think that misinformation is influencing people's views about public health. So I think the public has those concerns. And 
uh, so this is a very detailed diagram, but I'm going to just make a, a point is that um, what people know and think really does matter, and that's because it does affect their behaviors. And this is a, a cognitive model about how people make health decisions. And it basically says you've got these domains of perceived susceptibility, severity, benefits, barriers, cues action, and so on, self-efficacy. And so health information contributes to all of these things. So the decision to vaccinate against something like measles for your children would depend on looking at these kind of cues and so on. And this is the same thing. Again, sorry, there's so much text there, but the point is that misinformation, disinformation systematically erodes all of these strands that contribute to a person's decision to take health-seeking behavior. And you can see how if any of these weeks links are broken, for example, telling people that COVID-19 is a mild illness or the pandemic's fake, they're not going to go and get vaccination at that point. So you only have to, it's it's quite a fragile thing, uh, health-seeking behavior, and, it, and this link can be broken at many points along the way. And we're seeing this now with uh, immunization coverage for childhood vaccinations uh, was declining before the pandemic, but it really has taken a big dive, particularly for Māori and Pacific children. And uh, so uh, this is now creating um, a fact that New Zealand's very vulnerable for a measles epidemic and probably, probably whooping cough or pertussis as well. So how do you respond to disinformation? Well, I'm going to talk mention briefly something, uh, you know, we think, oh, fact-checking. Really, we don't spend much time on fact-checking. Um, this was one of my um, few attempts to do this, and this is when that well-known epidemiologist, Naz, said oh, that she had a very mild um, experience of COVID-19. I've had other normal flus, which have been 100 times worse, and she was making the case for the fact that really we didn't need to do anything much about it. And so I just had to point out that uh, that's a major error of thinking, generalizing from her experience to the entire world. But generally, fact-checking is um, not going to be terribly um, productive. And it's partly because we're up against huge global forces here. There's some political parties that are promoting blatant disinformation. Fortunately, they get very little, uh, very few votes. Obviously, Fox. And then you have these global groups, the Great Barrington Declaration, we had covered Plan B in New Zealand early in the pandemic. So we can see these huge forces operating. Uh, we've um, looked at um, disinformation. Other groups are looking at it a great deal. We had a uh, one-day course on it in February that John Kerr convened and had a huge amount of interest. But again, uh, it's quite hard to identify really systematic strategies um, uh, that are going to mean that we're not going to see suddenly disinformation disappearing. One aspect is protecting the messenger. Um, I've talked to a lot of other people who are involved in uh, commenting uh, about issues like the pandemic response. And after a while, you start to encounter really quite extreme pushback from organized efforts. My, my, myself and my family were, were highly, I would say, to some extent, amused to suddenly see these billboards appearing with my face on it across um, the country with a comment. It was only designed to nudge people towards vaccination. And that really had most of us scratching our heads about what on earth they were trying to say there. Um, and at one point I was really, uh, I joined, I moved from the team of five million to the team of five tyrants and had um, blogs by um, the, the wonderful commentator Cameron Slater, who uh, I joined that list of people, public health people, who he has um, absolutely attacked over the years. And he actually was um, convicted of um, and fined for some of the, the disinformation he produced on some uh, very well-established public health advocates. And one of the more extreme examples, I had a fake account, uh, Michael Faker was set up, which put out vaguely plausible sounding disinformation under my name with my photo and uh, name there. And it was only when you looked more closely, you could see it was Michael Faker. 
But this person really went for it, um, an average of 12 tw tweets a day for over a year, starting at 5 in the morning and going to 9 p.m. at night. I just don't know how he had the, or she had the time. Um, we asked for it to be taken down many times. Eventually, it was taken down. So I think just in conclusion, uh, advancing public health, it really does depend on well-functioning democratic processes. And we can think about the infrastructure, the strategic thinking, delivering interventions, research, and so on. And fundamentally, it's about addressing these key determinants, particularly the commercial determinants of health. And that does depend on strong democratic institutions and processes. So I really think we have a lot of, a lot of common interests here to discuss. Thank you. Okay, well, you had um, five groups. So um, would one of the spokespeople from one of the groups like to pose Michael a question? I don't know if you know what number of group you're in. Uh, if, if you do, uh, let's have group one. <laughs> so unmute yourself and then ask your question, please. Oh, yes, okay. Well, I made, I made a quick comment about um, wanting to broaden the conversation around in New Zealand about measures of deprivation, health and education and socioeconomics from one largely around one ethnic group to broaden it out to include all of those groups that are disadvantaged in some way. But that's not my, not the question. The question that we agreed and I got nominated, had my arm twisted to ask the question. It's this, has science itself uh, contributed to dissatisfaction in science? And if so, what could science itself do to redeem it? So <laughs> it's a very broad question, but Michael, I don't know whether you can think of an answer um, <laughs> off the top of your head. Well, one of the things about science that I think people uh, possibly, and I have spent my whole life getting to grips with the idea that um, that there's nothing true in science. It's just things that you are trying to refute endlessly and that you're building a sandcastle that's endlessly being washed away by the waves and you're building a new one. And that level of uncertainty, um, I don't think it always washes that well with everyone because people want, particularly when they're anxious, they want really hard knowledge. And the idea when you say, well, <clears throat> we're putting forward what we think is our best um, evidence for something, but it may actually change in the future, uh, I think might may weaken um, some of our um, arguments, particularly when they're up against ideological certainty that this is the way that the world is, and perhaps, and even um, theology and belief systems. So I think it's one of the, one of the issues about science that perhaps it, we haven't been very good at communicating the fact that it's all about degrees of certainty. Thank you. Thank you. Br brilliant. Thanks, Michael. Uh, uh, the next group, what would your question be? Just unmute yourself and then ask away. Um, I'll have a go. Right. So um, our question was related to um, disinformation and the um, commercialization of determinants, determinants of health. And actually, none of us had come across that term before. So it makes a lot of sense with what's going on at the moment. But um, the question is, how can New Zealand develop evidence that we can trust when we have lost the ability to produce the evidence? And so that was in relation to um, the loss of some of the um, organisations you know, like NZGG, New Zealand Guidelines Group and others. And um, I just wondered if you had a view on that. Yeah, well, I've been around long enough to have seen, to some extent, the erosion of some of our, I think, core um, science expertise in government agencies and um, the, the replacement by the generic policy analyst who is um, can be um, plugged and played in, on any topic, supposedly, and will just seek the knowledge from uh, content experts as required. And I think it's quite a naive um, uh, approach. And I know looking at um, institutions like the Ministry of Health and others that I've, I saw during the pandemic where because they'd been so uh, decreased in capacity because they'd become small ministries, uh, they really run by um, short-term labour, contract labour from the accounting firms. 
and even the the transformation of the health system was largely um, supported by contractors. And I think that's a real limitation of our central government agencies. Outside that, uh, I, I think we've had a lot of reorganizations of science, and I think that we've got the Crown Research Institutes and then various other attempts to try and um, consolidate science to give it more critical mass. And you've got the Centers for Research Excellence and also the, the Science Challenges. These, I think, are all attempts to try and organize our, our limited science resource around dealing with major problems. And I think they've all got real weaknesses. Uh, I haven't been tracking the current, some of the current discussion documents about reorganizing science, but um, I think it's been um, a succession of, of different experimental models which haven't succeeded very well. But the, the sum effect is that we've really decreased, I think, our science and technical capacity in central government. I don't know if that's addressed your concern, but I think we're one of the few countries in the world, I think you mentioned the guidelines group, one of the few countries in the world that doesn't have a, a health technology assessment capacity, mm -hmm. um, which you know is a real weakness, and it needs to look at things like cost effectiveness and so on. So, uh, yeah, I absolutely agree. I don't have an obvious, a, a simple answer, um, but I do think we need robust, sustained institutions in New Zealand that can allow science to really flourish. Yeah, thanks. Do, yeah, thanks. thank I you. Thought, well, 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 that, that, could we move on to the next next question, please? Perhaps uh, can I jump in there? Um, kia ora, Professor Baker. Um, look, I'm really interested to hear you talking about the um, the strategic uh, lack of strategic focus that we've had as a country. And I know um, Sir Peter Gluckman's done some work in that space as well. Um, my interest there is climate change, and um, it seems to me that um, we could do with a similar um, centre for communication around climate change just just interested in your thoughts about how transferable or how 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 the public health communication center might be a, a good model for use in other sectors such as climate change and, and elsewhere yeah um no it's a really good question and as soon as you start thinking about centers you start to sort of look around to see is there some models internationally and actually um there are, um, you know, the Science Media Centre, who I think do an excellent job, is uh, one of the few models that has been adopted by quite a few countries. But beyond that, there aren't many. There's no other public health communication centre I know of. I suspect there are some groups focusing on climate uh, change internationally that you could perhaps look at. Uh, I think that the core model is very transferable. Uh, I mean, we we have we do have um, in our in our brief um, looking at um, the uh, the broad idea of a healthy, sustainable environment, which obviously includes the climate, and uh, we think that's a much more important issue than pandemics. Even though I, I do a lot of work on pandemics, this is the one we have to get right. Uh, I think there's so much support for that. So we would will certainly until something better comes along, we'll certainly do our best to help. Okay, thanks, Michael. Um, thanks for the question, Chris. Um, right, uh, the fourth group. I think, yeah, I think we were, we might have been the third group, but uh, so sorry, apologies to anyone else that was group four, but um, our group was uh, interested in this concept of long-termism and um, wanted to ask Michael, how can you promote and develop trust in issues that are long-term how can you persuade people to trust a policy when it's impossible to prove how things will play out? You can do modeling and so on, but people can't see that that is definitely the way it's going to play out. And I think what Chris mentioned there with the parallels with um, just using climate change is one of those examples. People can say that, you know, if we don't do this now um, in the future, this is what's going to be the effect on the planet. But then other people will uh, look at that and say, but we don't know that's going to be the effect. And if we have some scientific invention that's going to save us, then that won't, you know, it won't be as catastrophic as we think. So trying to get buy-in for a policy, whatever it is, whether it's climate change or whatever, um, from people uh, on, on a long-term policy is, is uh, it seems quite, quite challenging. Mm. 
Yeah, look, I think this is the challenge of our age in many ways, is how to look over the hill at things we can't see right in our face, even though I think we can see it in our face, uh, how to act on those things. And in fact, um, do things that require us to invest in things, which means um, having less resources for maybe other more immediate priorities to achieve that. And hopefully these are, we can frame these as, as really positive trade-offs um, that people are making. But um, yeah, this is where you need, this is why you know, the IPCC has just put out obviously its sixth report. Uh, I mean, it's overwhelming evidence from multiple disciplines about the need to act. And I think just even the descriptions seem to be getting more and more vivid about the consequences. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a massive task that the communication goal. Uh, when we looked at, you've got long-term thinking and long-termism is a particular moral philosophy, which is quite interesting. There's some good books that have come out about it. But um, there are... Um, one thing would be to shift to a four or five year political term. The other is to shift decision making on key issues away from the political, the elected political realm and put them more into long term commissions. Just like we've got a parliamentary commissioner for the environment, we could have one for catastrophic risk. One specifically, um, I'm, I'm not quite sure what institution we've got for climate change, but just thinking about this. And yeah, I think the good point about Jonathan Boston has written about this and others. I, I think that people studying government have looked at um, ways of doing this. There, there are mechanisms and um, a number of countries are, are ahead of New Zealand, I think, in, in doing this. Otherwise, you see what we're seeing at the moment is these really short term, very frustrating trade offs to, for electability is trading off some of the obvious climate change goals against um, um, you know, the bread and butter budget or whatever we're going to have. So um, we want to shift that stuff away from the, the short-term political um, expediency environment we're in. Thank you. You're muted, Simon. Okay, uh, I'm unmuted now. Um, um, I think there's one more group with a question. Am I right? Yes, our group still had a question too. Um, it's okay if we want to skip over it though. Go for it. This, this um, is the last question. So make it a good one. Well, we were really interested in the institutions of democracy that we'd perhaps need focus on to be strengthened. Um, and you've since referenced that as being ones that allow science to flourish. But are there any further thoughts or ideas as to which institutions and which elements of that um, are of should be a particular focus and what we, we, we should do to strengthen those institutions? Yeah, I, I think um, some of the more model, the um, novel forms of decision-making that I know your group has talked about, I know Simon is um, very actively involved and in, I think we do need to explore those and give, resource them much better. Um, but I do think, um, trying to identify ways of shifting a lot of critical medium to long-term issues out of the day-to-day -day political fray and put them more in the form of um, commissions that are really empowered to get on and work on them um, with a multi-year or multi-decade um, agenda. And they're, they're given real authority to do that. Uh, and uh, I think in a way, the Public Sector Act, which... Um, shifted the dynamic between ministers and de government departments from the 90s has really been problematic because it's meant that the government agencies that might have, that used to lead their own agendas can't do that now. They're much more, as I understand it, responsive to ministers. And so I think we, if that's going to be the model, we do need separate institutions that have, I think, the ability to run with these issues, take them out of the of the political um, realm to some degree, you still have to have accountability, but make it much more accountability for long-term um, um, uh, uh, processes. And I'm not an expert in how to do that, but it's certainly possible. Okay. Um, thanks for that, uh, Michael. Um, good question, Carla. Um, mm. Now, um, I'm, I'm going to call a, to a close this part of the AGM. Uh, 
I'd like um, to thank Michael sincerely for um, leading this his his talk and leading this uh, this session. Um, so perhaps we could all just uh, show our appreciation, and we'll say farewell to Michael. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. I really felt I was uh, in a group with like-minded people, and um, I really hope to carry on the discussion in the future. And I really look forward to the wonderful new initiatives that um, your organisation can really promote in New Zealand because we we really need them. So thank you very much for all the good work you're doing. Thanks, and, uh, Thank you. Be in touch.